Hey folks, in this interview, it's all about how to fake your way to getting rich on Instagram with my buddy, Trey Radcliffe. This is Twitter. Hey, folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. My name is Frederick Van Johnson. I'm your host. I'm sitting here with my good buddy, Mr. Trey Ratcliffe. Trey and I are going to talk about the idea or the, uh, the, the secrets to getting rich on Instagram or how to fake your way to getting rich. And we know that that's a clickbait sort of title. Um, and it's on purpose for several reasons. And it, it sort of feeds into what the, the overall theme of the book is. So Trey Ratcliffe, man, welcome to This Week in Photo again. How are you doing? Good. How's it going, FDJ? It's going good. It's going good. How's the weather uh, down under? Uh, good. Um, it is uh, coming into autumn now here in New Zealand, so the nights are getting a little cooler. The sun is going down a little earlier, but it's great. This is a it's a good place. It has four proper seasons, three months of each season, and they're all quite different photographically. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I mean, it's like like whenever I talk to you, it sounds like the uh, the photographer's dream to be living, you know, as they say, Middle Earth or whatever down there. So that's it's really cool. Yeah. Um, we have our- autumn workshop coming up i think you joined us for an autumn workshop a few years ago i did i did here. yeah it's uh we always get a really fun group of people out here and it's fun to share the, the world of new zealand with them you know yeah and it is a different world and i you know once again thank you for that because we we had some we had some pretty interesting adventures flying around in helicopters landing on glaciers and you know <laughs> it was yeah. all kinds of madness and fun there so that was good um so the title of this and you know i we we have limited time so i want to i want to make sure we dive in on this and we can we can do a follow-up interview later um uh, but I want to talk about this. So you you actually have, by the time this interview airs, you will have released a book that's titled How to Fake Your Way to Getting Rich on Instagram. So tell me about that, first of all. Tell me about the, the title and where that came from. Yeah, the, the subtitle of it is uh, Influencer Fraud, Ego, Anxiety, Selfies, and Mass Delusional Behavior. Yeah. Oh. And I... <laughs> I almost called the book actually how to stay Zen on social media and actually over half the book is dedicated to that very subject because I do see Instagram and other social networks generally causing a significant amount of anxiety, which is often unfounded. And a lot of the stuff that you see, I think generally we know it's not real, but I think people will be surprised to find out how much actual fraudulent behavior is happening. Yeah. Um, it started out as a an article that Wired asked me to write, um, and I ended up just getting so much information, and I'm kind of an insider, and I was able to expose a few people in the book, um, and I talked to Instagram security, and they confirmed all this stuff. So it's kind of a really fun adventure ride about how I kind of fell down this rabbit hole. By the way, I didn't I didn't fake my way to get on Instagram. <laughs> Good. Thank you for clarifying. I, I, show, I show how it's done. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know the the interesting thing is, and why I'm really excited for to to read this is because I think a lot of us have have, you know, we've seen the tip of the iceberg. We've seen inkling in different news articles. Like I think I saw a news article once about how you can buy likes or whatever from vending machines in Russia, and you know different things. You can get on uh, Fiverr.com and buy page views and likes to 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 artificially inflate your presence. And the scary thing about it for me is like. You can a lot of the stuff we do, like say for advertising on this week in photo, the advertisers just look at that number, right? So they look at the number and say, "Oh, you got this many likes, you got this many views, or this many friends, and therefore your check will be this." If you could just spend a couple dollars and inflate that number, the, that kind of blows everything out of the water. Is that the is that the general premise of the book? Yeah, that is the general premise of the book, absolutely, and. You know, it happens across every industry from, you know, beauty to health to uh, luxury travel to, um, you know, you name it, it happens everywhere. And the reason that I kind of stumbled into this is because in one of the many hats that I wear, uh, the main business is still fine art photography and selling prints. That's, you know, the photography and kind of spreading consciousness. That's sort of my raison d'etre, right? Yeah. And, and throughout this lifelong Um, quixotic mission, I do encounter more and more people that are having like very high anxiety lives that have been 
you know, influenced in the wrong way by Instagram and these things. And so one of the hats that I wear is I, I actually am an influencer, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I do it in the luxury travel industry. Um, for example, one of our partners is uh, the Ritz Carlton. Mm-hmm. And we did like a three or four year thing with them called 80 Stays Around the World, where I would go stay at their properties and take photos and blab about on social media, stuff like that, right? And it, it's significant. You know, it's a six figure thing. Yeah. Right. So right. they put a lot of cash into this. And sometimes I end up at these luxury travel social media influencer events, which I find to be, you know, almost intolerable. <laughs> and I I meet some of these other people and, you know, there's just sort of like a, a hollowness or an emptiness, like there's no substance there. And, you know, I like to have deep conversations right away. So I try to, like, figure out what's going on with these people. And then I start to think like, well, you know what, their pictures really aren't that great and they're kind of boring. And I'm like, how are they? Because they're getting similar or sometimes bigger deals than me. So then I started digging in, digging into it. Um, and I found out that they're, you know, buying some or most of their followers. They're buying comments, uh, you know, little emoji comments, or yeah. you can actually make your own custom comments that you can write in a spreadsheet and send to these services. Oh my God. They'll spring these comments. They're buying likes. And then they go to these big brands. Um, you name it. There's car, they go to car companies, uh, they go to Prada bags, um, fashion companies, luxury travel, and they say, "Look at all this stuff I have. Give me some money, and let me travel the world for free. Get a, give me a bunch of free stuff, and then I'll I'll talk about it." And to me, this is just absolute fraud. And mm-hmm. we we show in the book how these are coming just from click farms in India or China. All this activity is non-human scripts acting on remote computers, and it's. A huge, it's actually a huge problem. Um, we have tons of examples of the book in just 48 hours. I, I found like over 200 people across every industry and I kind of show how it's done. So it's very, it's very interesting. And then I go into it like, well, why isn't Instagram cleaning it up? You know, are they complacent? Are they complicit? Cause they just want big numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, we get into the algorithms of how, you know, we're being socially hacked by what's being shown. And so many people now are trying to emulate some of their influencer heroes, which is all based on fraud, right? And all these influencer heroes are out there making everyone else feel like shit because their lives are sad and they're not getting to do all these fabulous things. Getting, and But that's all based on a fraudulent um, you know, story that doesn't even exist. Is it so – do, do you feel like – is it like the housing uh, bubble? I mean is this like a – is this like a – in other words, are we at the beginning of something and then, you know, it'll be it'll become mainstream knowledge in a couple of years and people are like, holy, holy crap, I was taken like Bernie Madoff kind of thing, you know, and then we'll have a we'll have a shakeout and then things will be normal. Is it, Or are we just going to, you know, continue with this trajectory? Is there an end in sight? I don't know. I, I wonder if it's just an all lost cause in a way, because. You know, last year kind of was the year of fake news. And so now people are kind of much more suspicious about what they read about. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, maybe maybe I should vaccinate my children, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. Now people are a little bit more suspicious about this kind of stuff. Um, But also it's still a problem. The algorithms are still a problem because they do encourage uh, interaction and passionate interaction. And this is for one reason why you see anti-vaxxers growing. You see, there's now more flat earthers, more of these idiots than ever before, because they just encourage each other in this echo chamber. Yep. And and a lot of it is begun by people who appear to have lots of followers and a lot of influence, and it's all fake to begin with. Now, what's what's going to happen? The thing is with Instagram, sometimes if you see something, it looks real. Like if you see someone enjoying a glass of champagne on a yacht, um, it looks real. Uh, People are suspicious about a fake news story, but if you start seeing pictures, they just appear to be real. But in, in many cases, it's it's not real at all. Now, where is all this going? What's the future of it? Yeah, I I think that um, there's this great book by Yuval Noah Harari, *Sapiens* and *Homo Deus*, and he posits this brilliant insight that humans are the only animal on the planet that collectively believe in a fiction so that we can cooperate with strangers. For example, like time doesn't exist. Really, you can't see it or touch it, Mm -hmm. but it makes it convenient for you and I to meet at 3 p.m. There's no actual thing as money, but we all believe in it so you can cooperate with strangers. There's no such thing as a meter, but we all agree on what a meter is. 
And this allows billions of humans to cooperate, right? But now there's new metrics. There's followers, likes, and comments. And these are traded for real cash as these. But if you can't trust any of these numbers, then Instagram will become like Venezuela. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, if you can't trust them, then what's the what's the solution? I mean, it, it, and it's a twofold question, right? So, on the one hand, you know, as a as a person that participates in social media, should you just is there some way that you can look through a filter and say this person's real, this person's not real? And then the other side of it is from like an advertiser or sponsor perspective. If those folks, which many of them watch this show, they're watching this show and you're like, oh crap. Okay. (laughs) I'm giving, you know, five figures a month to this person over here. Are they real? Right. They should question that. But if they do question it, what's, what's the, you know, how do, how do they figure it out? Does your book tell them, look at these key indicators in order to figure out if someone's true or fake? Yeah. We take a few people that I know are faking it and have been confirmed by Instagram security. And I break down how you can see this. There's lots of tools online. It's a bit of a cumbersome process, but it's kind of fun in a way if you get into it. Yeah. Because you're right. Most brands and agencies, they don't know. Um, I'll give you one example from the book. Uh, there, an agency recommended, I was going to Thailand and sometimes I like to hook up with local influencers so that we can have a little bit of a multiplier effect, right? And they recommended this account called at Amazing Thailand. Okay, you can look up. Mm-hmm. Now, so I looked at the photos. The photos were fine. They're kind of a, a photo aggregation site, so they don't take all the photos themselves, which I guess is okay as long as they give credit, which they seem to. Hundreds of thousands of followers, lots of engagement. But then I looked them up, and then it's all fake. Um, I showed this one method because there's many ways to get followers. One is called follow unfollow. And you can clearly see a mathematical pattern how they paid a service to follow 7,500 random people and then unfollow them, then follow 7,000 and unfollow. And over time, some of those, these are random people. Mm -hmm. Some of these random people follow back and you just kind of accumulate mass like barnacles on a ship. Um, So then I went back to the agency. I said, like, I don't have time to do their homework for them. They should be figuring this stuff out. So a lot of times they don't know how to do this. And there's, there's a more, um, there's another problem, which is a little harder to detect, but you can still see it if you look in the right way. And it's uh, people that work in pods, which I consider to be unethical and inauthentic interaction. Mm-hmm. Do you know what these are? Um, l- let, me, let, me, let me take a guess, and you can tell me if I'm right. A pod is, is a bunch of influencers that sort of get together, sort of like a mastermind, and pool their resources. So if, if each of, if, say it's five people, and each of them has a million followers, they go to a brand and say, collectively, we have a footprint of five million, and pay us X thousands of dollars, and we will, we will get your message out across our individual millions of, of viewers or fans. Is that, is that fair? There are groups that do that, but those are not pods. Mm. What pods are, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that, by the way, what you're saying is you just kind of have a little bit of collective bargaining power. Yeah. You yeah. know, if that group of people, they do have legitimate followers, I think that's perfectly fine and smart in many ways. But a pod, there's small pods and big pods. And these can be a group of 10 people, 50 people, or sometimes thousands of people. And let's say, let's go it's in every industry, right? But let's just stick with like travel industry. What happens when you're in a pod, let's say a typical size is about a hundred. Okay. It's like a cabal and you're all required. Whenever you post a photo, you, you put it into your group and you might be communicating on WhatsApp, maybe inside Instagram, maybe in Facebook, there's all kinds of ways for the pod to stick together. And you're required within a pod to, for everyone else in the pod, you've got to go comment on the photo in the first five minutes. The comment has to be over three words. Um, you have to like it because what happens then is the Instagram algorithm sees like, oh, this photo is getting a lot of interaction. Mm. And normally, you know, your photo might only be seen by 2% of your audience, right? Let's say you have 5,000 followers, maybe only 100 people are going to see your photo because of the way the algorithm works. But if it's getting a lot of interaction, Instagram might pop it up to 10, 20, or 50% of your audience. So I find these pods to be unethical in two ways. One, they're kind of gaming the system and you're stuck in this cabal. Uh, two, and this is the more malicious way, is sometimes people in the pods do have agreements with um, brands or agencies or like Qantas. Let's say you're getting a you know, first class flight from you know, New York to Sydney, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they're going to post a photo of them just enjoying champagne in first class. 
And then immediately they're going to get like 99 comments from everyone else on the pod, likes, all this kind of stuff. And there's going to be saying like, oh man, that was like a great flight. Quantum is such a good company. And, but it's all fake. This is all coerced um, interaction and none of it's real. And so Quanta sees that and go like, oh, look at all this interaction it's getting. But everyone, they have to do that. And if they, if they stop doing it, they're kicked out of the pod and then all of their photos dramatically get less likes and less comments in the future. Oh, so okay. it's, uh, uh, it's not a, it's actually, this is against uh, Instagram's uh, terms and conditions. These pods are a little more slippery to catch because they are real people, but it's all coerced behavior meant to, um, meant to get fraudulent activity. Yeah. That's like, it, it like that's collusion, right? <laughs> that's, yeah. that's collusion at its most pure sense. Wow. So that's just one way that you outline. So how many, like in, off the top of your head, how many different ways are there to game the system that people are using today? Uh, there's at least five or six that uh, I show in there. There's probably some that I was unable, unable to find. As part of a fun experiment, we took my assistant, Tane, who's this good-looking Kiwi kid, and we bought, we got him a fake account, and then we bought him about 110,000 followers. We bought him lots of custom comments that we wrote ourselves, a bunch of likes, and um, and then he started to get approached by big brands and big agencies to represent them. And so for this fake account, we used every possible method to get his following up high. Um, and it yeah. worked. And it worked. Yeah, there's there's other things you can do which are a little bit less gray in the ethics area, which are you, c you can pay these services, online services, to automatically reply to everyone that comments on your thing. Because the Instagram algorithm also likes it when you, the user, are – um, replying quickly. If you're showing you're engaged with your commenters, they like that. Hmm. So you can pay a service and you can give them like a hundred things to say. And like if Fred, if you comment on my photo, like in, within 10 seconds, the service will come and say, thanks. I had a great time taking this photo. Right. It'll say at Fred Van, hmm. thanks. So it looks like me, but it's not me, you know, meanwhile, I'm often involved with some other pod or whatever, you know, it's just, it's, I think it's, this is what I consider to be mass delusional behavior. Yeah. Um, how people are just like obsessed with this whole sensation. Yeah. And then from, from a corporate standpoint, you know, I can, I can see, you know, if you're a brand and you're a, you know, a, a reasonably, but not rich, richly paid social media manager. And your metric is your boss is just like, Hey, we have this campaign going out. I want you to promote it. Here's some dollars. And you know, at the end of it, I, I want to see results. And if you're giving them results, you know, should they probe deeper to see if those results are fake? You know, would they do that? You know, because it's going to make yeah. them look bad. It's going to make them look like a fool if they say, hey, yeah, I got taken, by the way. This, yeah, this is a, a really good point. And in a lot of cases, it is middle marketing managers at medium to big size brands that are the problem. Because you're right, they have budgets of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. And they just want big numbers that they put into a PowerPoint and show their boss, right? The bigger the numbers, the more engagement, the better it looks. And in a lot of cases, these campaigns are not just one person, but you know, over a month, they might be giving out 100 free flights on Qantas mm -hmm. or 100 free Prada purses or whatever it is. And so they roll all these numbers up into some big number of impressions and this kind of stuff. And that they're able to show their boss like, oh man, this is great. Look, I'm just killing it. But here's the problem. And I remember this, I had this, back in my 20s, I had, um, uh, I used to do online games, mm -hmm. an online game company. And I was in a, a board meeting and this, we had this billionaire investor who's a great friend named Michael Isley. And so I was hearing all the other things, uh, reports from his other companies and someone was giving him numbers and he's like, can I trust these numbers? And then the, this middle guy, middle manager guy was like, well, I think these numbers are right. And he slams the desk. He goes, God damn it. I want the truth. You know, and this is the thing. Bosses want the truth, even if it's bad news. Mm -hmm. And because a boss can't steer a company in a certain direction if it's based on fraudulent numbers. Yeah. So it, it is, it's imperative for the, who's ever in charge to really do a deep dig and find out what's going on because the companies that do the deep dive and make sure they have the right kind of influence that's on board, these are the ones that are going to be successful as opposed to these other ones, which are completely ineffective.
It, it sounds like this might be the beginning of a of a brand new career field, like a you know a a social media private investigator, <laughs> you know, someone that those marketing managers can just hire whenever they hire a new influencer, just to vet them and make sure that they are who they say they are, right? And then they come back with a yes or a no, and they move on. That 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 might help solve it, right? No, I, I agree. And this is another good point in that every other aspect of life, you have background checks, like a credit background check, yeah, you know, criminal background check, whatever. There's no background check for influencers. And it's still very hard to figure out because all the numbers are behind the Instagram wall. They do let a few numbers out so you can kind of intuit things and piece things together, you know, like CSI Instagram, but it's still very, very time consuming. There's a few services on the web that, that say they know how to like what percentage of a user's following is real, but they don't really know either. I did some investigations that they have no idea what they're talking about. These are automated services. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but besides all this fraud stuff, I think, which is interesting and it kind of gets people in there. The whole second half of the book is really about, you know, what's really happening on social media, what's happening to your brain. How do you stay Zen? How do you not take any of it seriously? And it's, it's actually, a, there's a growing problem. I had some studies in there about selfies. Mm -hmm. especially among uh, women. Uh, there was a study uh, of women, girls, between the ages of 16 and 29, and they, took, they put them into three groups, A, B, and C. And group A, they could take a selfie, uh, just, of, just of their face, not their body. They couldn't retouch it, and they had to upload it. Okay, group B, they could take as many selfies as they wanted, and they could retouch all they wanted and then upload their favorite. Group C took no selfies. They just kind of read news on the Internet. And then they would measure the level of anxiety increase uh, for both group A and B. Anxiety just still went up. It went up higher for the untouched selfie, but it still went up even for the retouched selfie. Uh, feelings of uh, confidence uh, both went way down and feelings of physical attractiveness. Uh, actually, they both went equally down for the people that retouched and the, and the untouched selfie just equally. Because they say the people that were retouching, they weren't confident in the way they look, so that made them feel less attractive. Right. And so, you know, just the mere act of taking a selfie, and a lot of these people are emulating their influencer heroes out there. Now, I'm not saying all selfies are bad at all. I mean, some fun selfies, quick ones, they're totally cool. You're telling a story, but you know the you know the bad kind of selfies when you see them, right? And so, the amount of psychological damage this is doing to, of course, it's not just females; it's males too. But you're constantly being reminded multiple times per day that you're, you're not attractive enough, uh, you're losing confidence, it increases anxiety. And this is, uh, we don't really know the long-term effects on society of this, but just the constant reminder that you're not good enough on this big public scoreboard of social media, it's just not healthy or even natural human behavior. Yeah, and especially if it's like you said, it's all predicated on a lie to begin with. If they're just emulating what their influencer heroes are doing, and those influencers have have built up fake personas, right? So, right. yeah, so it's a you know you talk about that unattainable beauty standard that that used to be in the news all the time. It still is, you know that uh, you know no one can ever be that skinny. No one could ever have that lifestyle, right? So, man, it's crazy. There's so much to dive into. It sounds like you're you're talking about the the sort of the catfishing of the social media influencer industry, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a catfishing for millions of dollars in fish. Um, I'm going to let you go because you, you have things to do. Um, I want to continue this after the, the book has launched. And tell me about what, the, what the, the tentative launch date and all that stuff is. Oh, well, we're going exclusive, exclusively to Amazon. And mm, I can't say like any day now, we and I have. I'm still not decided if we're gonna do a pre-release or not. We might do a pre-release uh, for a, a week or two. Um, so it's gonna be on Kindle and it's gonna be physical copy too. You get off Amazon. Awesome. All right, Trey Radcliffe, our intrepid deep diving expose reporter, <laughs> coming to us. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Well, like I said, I'll I'll definitely check in with you when you are. Uh, you know, this thing is out into the wild and you're getting responses from it. I'd love to see how the, the world responds to the, the revelation that, you know, probably a lot of the people that you admire are just like you, only they decided to, to buy their, their friends, followers.
followers, likes, and and comments, right? So cool, man. Uh, if people want to catch up with you, they want to you know follow Trey Radcliffe and and see what your intrepid adventures are. Where should they head over to? Yeah, uh, best place is always the blog where I put up a new photo and tell a new story every day. For the last twelve years, wow, about four thousand there on stuckincustoms.com. Um, and, you know, if they're interested in the fine art thing, they go over to treyratcliffe.com. That is actually one thing I should say is some people might suspect that I'm writing this book because I'm upset that I'm, other people are stealing social media work or whatever. That's not – like less than 10 percent of our income comes from these social media type things. Um, so I think that's one reason I'm able to talk about it because we don't – it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, and as far as the book goes um, – we do have a Facebook group that we're starting for the book where everyone, cause I kind of want to like start a discussion about it, you mm-hmm. know, cause it's not really being discussed in a mature uh, way. Uh, so we have a link there um, on, on the blog too, for the new uh, Facebook group as well. Very cool. All right, Trey Radcliffe. Thank you so much for your time today, man. I appreciate you. Adios muchacho. See ya. This is Twitter.